It is now time for the Fans in the Stands t-shirt toss out sponsored by Hutch Chevrolet. We make the trip to Somerset. It's always a packed house when Southwestern and Pulaski meet on the hardwood. Despite the weather tonight, there was no exception. Why not? Fans wanting to get their hands on some free Appalachian wireless sports overtime t-shirts. That is tonight's Fans in the Stands t-shirt toss out sponsored by Hutch Chevrolet. Okay, now the Pineville Lady Lions entered tonight looking to repeat as champions of the 13th Region All-A Tournament. But standing in their way, the Harlan Lady Dragons, winners of four of the last five Region All-A's. Well, or actually three out of the last four. We'll see if they'll make it four out of five as we go to Barberville High School. Harlan taking on Pineville. Jordan Brock misses the jumper, but Emma Bianchi on cleanup duty. Lady Dragons up 4 nothing. Ensuing possession, Pineville cuts the deficit in half with this Jillian Enoch shot. Her foot was on the line. And then Erica Gambrell throws in a three-pointer as well right here. And the Lady Lions go up by one. Devin Enix decides to get in on the three-party as well. Pineville still up one after that bucket. Back comes Harlan. Brock from downtown. And the Lady Dragons lead by three. Then watch this ball movement. Brock in the corner to Macy Charles. She gets it to Caitlin Jenkins. Quickly down to Bianchi, who misses the first time, but does not miss the second and draws the foul. Free throw no good. Harlan, though, a five-point lead. But Devin Enix says, I'll have a slice of that lead. Another three for the senior. Lady Lions within two. Upike top play contender. Gambrel, the steal, beats everybody up the floor for the layup, but Pineville down by five. Second quarter now, Devin Enix is going to be good again from beyond the arc. Had a nice ball game. The Ville within a deuce. Lady Dragons respond. Tori Mitchell going to power her way in for two. Harlan up four. Then it's Brock slicing and dicing to the basket. At the other end, watch as he kisses it off the glass. And then U-Pike top play contender, Pineville's Emily Mullins. Watch, she fakes out four defenders <laughs> and scores. Pineville back within four. Then it's Gambrel. Leading the break, finds Mullins spotted up for three. Lady Lions on the comeback trail. Down just three at halftime, but in the third quarter, too much Harlan. Bianchi cans the jumper, and then we end with a U-Pike top play contender. Brock, watch. We call this the dipsy Do move. And the foul. Free throw good, and Harlan goes on to win this one as we go to the Highlands Health System scoreboard. 68-66 over Pineville. Tanner, that makes it four out of five for Harlan. Pineville upset Lynn Camp in the semis by a couple of points. Lynn Camp, two losses on the season, but Harlan, a very good team, surprising a lot of people. They go back to, to the All-A State, a place where they're very familiar with. Congratulations to the Lady Dragons. This game may be a little closer than a lot of people were anticipating. I think you have to give Pineville credit, Josh. I saw them in the first or second game of the year, and where they were to where they are now, the Lady Lions have improved a great deal. Derek Cal has the Lady Dragons back in the All-A State tournament. They will look to win a game, something they did not were not able to do a couple of years ago. The other girls 14th all a semifinal tonight over at Perry Central Jenkins meeting up with Buckhorn right off the bat. The state's leading scorer Whitney Creech buries the three pointer and the Lady Cavs jump out to the three point lead off the miss. Creech now battling inside gets the board, puts it back up and in Jenkins still by a trade. Mercedes Boggs being aggressive at the point, receives the pass, takes it strong to the basket off the glass for two. Jenkins by one. Madison Couch had a big game for the Wildcats. Here she gets the bucket down low. Buckhorn, though, still trailing in early on. At the other end, Creech tries to drive, but she's cut off by LaVon Henson. Spin move doesn't work. Spins back the other way, goes baseline, puts it up off the glass. Jenkins leads it by four. Second quarter, Buckhorn goes inside to Kansas Rice. Rice, a big game as well, down low for Buckhorn. We're all tied up. Now the outside game, the kick out to Henson. The three ball is good, and Buckhorn has a three-point lead. How about our long John Silver shot of the night? Back and forth, the three is no good, but watch Creech fly in for the offensive board, put it back in. We're all tied up. One more shot from number five. The three ball rattles home for Creech. She scored a game-high 34 points as Jenkins hangs on to beat Buckhorn late. 74-70. to They will meet Leslie County in the championship game tomorrow night at Perry Central. Staying on the Highlands Health System scoreboard, South Laurel and Bell County. Number one Lady Cats defeat the Lady Cardinals 79-57. In boys action, Wolf County all over Owsley 49-17. Girls action, Paintsville off their All-A championship. They lose to Johnson Central, 61-45. And in boys, or the girls action, excuse me, Henry Clay over Knox Central, 
to 25. And finally, staying on the Highlands Health System scoreboard, 53rd District, number 10, Letcher Central Lady Cougars, 49-23 over JBS. And then boys action, Letcher Central completes the sweep, 63-37 over June Buchanan. Coming up next on the Appalachian Wireless Sports Overtime, Southwestern and Pulaski County get together in girls action over at the Wigwam Gym. And it's a top 10 girls showdown in Williamsburg as number 8 Corbin pays a visit to number 3 Whitley County. The University of the Cumberland's football team put forth a valiant effort, but the Patriots fell to Grandview, Iowa 35-23 this afternoon in the NAIA National Championship game. WYMT's Josh McKinney is in Rome, Georgia, where the title game took place. Josh? The forecast called for some rain here in Rome, Georgia for the National Championship game, but instead the weather was perfect for some football. That is, until the very end. John Bland and Mike Woodley leading number one Cumberland and number two Grandview to the first national championship game in each program's history. The Patriots' explosive offense had its chance from the get go, receiving the opening kickoff, but the Viking defense showed immediately why they're ranked number two nationally in points allowed. And on Grandview's ensuing drive, the worst possible thing happened a 59 yard touchdown on third and long to give them a 7 0 lead just minutes into the game. You know, we, we, we like to play uh, in a way that we don't have to rely on our defense. Um, you know, that's kind of what I was saying to the guys at halftime was just, let's, put, let's go out there and play a game where we don't need to rely on our defense. And, uh, you know, I think we did that a little bit. Things didn't get any better for Cumberlands as Grandview would race out to a 21-3 lead early in the second quarter thanks to a couple of touchdown passes from sophomore Derek Fulton. But that's when the momentum would begin to shift. Coach has pretty much told us, you know, not to, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to end like this, you know, just keep keep fighting. Things will eventually go our way. And it did it did there for a while. We just had a couple uh, a couple mess ups as a team overall. And uh, uh, but for the most part, I think that we uh, really put it to them there during the uh, second, third. D'Angelo Jordan scored the Patriots first touchdown in the middle of the second quarter to cut the lead to 11. And Adam Craig made it a four point game with a quarterback sneak a few drives later. But it was the defense that excited the crowd with a goal line stand right before halftime. Uh, like I said, uh, I think we come back out and we get stopped on fourth and fourth and goal and on the one, and it would have been up 28, 21. There's a lot of lot of what ifs and a lot of buts, but and uh, here's another one. <laughs> Just uh, we didn't quite get it done. The third quarter was a defensive battle with neither team putting any points on the board, which set the stage for the final 15 minutes of the season. And although it was a different quarter, it was the same old story. A Cumberland's offense that could not capitalize on opportunities and a Grandview defense that did just the opposite. And as the rain began to fall on the Barron Stadium field, the hopes of a Cumberland's national championship also began to damper. When you play the type of offense that they do play, uh, we were hoping if you could get a 10-point 10, 10 lead, 9-point uh, lead, uh, and make them throw the football and play catch up a little bit, uh, you know, we felt we had them then because you get a, you know, we, we got that, the lead that we had there. Uh, it, it, it's hard to overcome that when you don't, you know, you don't throw the ball around too much. And uh, we got them in that situation, obviously, and uh, it worked for us. A great season for our, for our program, for our community, for our uh, campus. Uh, I can't be, I can't just tell you how proud I am of these guys and all the rest. Uh, the way they represented us. We didn't make enough plays tonight. Uh, felt like uh, we fought and we were we were good enough to win the ball game, which is which is what you want. And uh, we just didn't make the plays and, and Grandview did. The Cumberlands will lose a bevy of seniors who have been instrumental in getting the program to this point. But Coach Bland and the players believe this will be the first of many trips to the national title game. In Georgia with the Patriots, Josh McKinney for Sports Overtime Saturday night. All right, a waterlogged Josh McKinney reporting from Rome, Georgia. Josh, thank you. Let's shift gears. Some non-conference Division II basketball action between two coverage area teams this afternoon out in Harrogate, Tennessee. The number 20 ranked Lincoln Memorial welcoming in UVA Wise. Laquan Choice stops and pops from the free throw line, puts the rail splitters up too early. Cavalier Dion Boyce, you'll hear his name quite a bit for the Cavs, gets the teardropper to go. We're tied early. They were letting him play at Tex Turner Arena. Vincent Bailey gets mauled under the basket. Skill gets it to go for LMU. And then Boyce with the ball for UVA Wise takes on the defender, gets the basket, and one. How about the catch and shoot here from Buckhorn native Matt Day? 
Former Wildcat at Buckhorn hits good, pulls wise within two. Boyce backing down the rail splitter defender, rolls around the rim a few times and finally falls in. Off the wise turnover, Curtis Webb to Paul Woodson for the easy layup at the other end. Watch the dish there and then the kiss off the glass. LMU lead back up to six. High to low action for the rail splitters. Webb finds Bailey for the easy deuce up by four. Charles George showing off his ball skills going one on one gets the reverse layup to drop wise within three. Javon Moore passes to a wide open James Turner who nails the three for the Cavs. It was a close game at the half as we go to the scoreboard. The Lincoln Memorial rail splitters turned on the offense in the second half and beat UVA wise 83 to 57 and the loss for the Cavaliers Dion Boyce notched his sixth double double on the season with 22 points and 16 rebounds. Coming up next high school basketball highlights from the legacy Nissan shootout over in London. With back-to-back -back losses coming into today's Nissan Legacy Classic, the number eight Cordia Lions were, of course, looking for a win. Their opponent, well, they came into the game with the exact opposite momentum, winning two in a row. Let's get out to North Laurel High School. That was Roderick Rhodes talking in the huddle. Cordia taking on Scott. Jeremy Jackson, the three-pointer to go, and the foul, and there's the free throw. We're knotted up at 24. Then it's Jackson again, this time giving it to teammate Blake Schneider, who drains the three. Scott takes the lead, 27-24. Scott was hot. That's how you would describe this second quarter. Big fella Cameron Cribb knocking one in from downtown. Scott up six, but Cordia comes out in the second half. That's when they started firing on all cylinders. Third quarter, C.C. Cunningham drives the lane, takes it in, 41-40, Lions with the lead. Off the Scott miss now, J.J. Catchings gets the rebound there, pushes it ahead. A.J. Tagalo, a fun name to say, even more fun player to watch. Cordia by three. Back to Cunningham now, Tagaloa misses, Cunningham grabs the board, puts it up and in. Cunningham finished with a triple-double, 19 points, 10 boards, 10 assists. Now it's Catchings dribbling and then passing the rock off to A.J. Chisholm, who puts it in, Cordia up 10. Here's a nice feed from Felix Frimpong to Tagaloa, who lays it in. Cordia rolling up 11. How about Frimpong this time? He's going to pick off the pass like a defensive back, takes it the distance, up and in, sprints back. And then we go back to Cunningham one more time. He's going to fake right, then go left with the Euro step right there, scores. And we go to the scoreboard. Cordia wins this one, 88-68, a 20-point win for the Lions over Covington Scott. Next game of the day featured Patrick Robinson and his Williamsburg Yellow Jackets taking on Taylor County. First quarter, you can't miss this guy, Corey Shelton. Blonde Mohawk and all sinks the three-pointer. Jackets down three. Williamsburg working the ball around here on this possession. Dalton Sizemore over to Eric Poor to Lowry Chase. Back inside Sizemore. Good fundamentals there. Willie Bird still down two. What a game for Quentin Gooden for Taylor County. Here he is driving the length of the floor. Strong move to the basket. TC up three. Dalton Sizemore makes pretty passes on the football field. Not right there on the basketball court. Gooden snatches it. Throws down the one-handed jam at the other end. Jackets down four now. Gooden guarding Shelton. Forces Taylor County to switch defenders. Likes the matchup he has. Gets into the lane. Gets the basket plus the harm. Free throw would be good. Jackets down two after the charity toss. Second quarter now. Gooden right where he left off. Lines up from three. Bangs it in. Taylor County up five. Back to Shelton now. Gets the handoff from Griffith Andrew. Then hits the jumper off the glass. Williamsburg hanging around down just three. The Andrew Shelton hookup again. Passes it. Shelton buries the three while falling down. And the mustard mohawk, he wants some more. Shelton pulls up right on the Taylor County defender. We go to the scoreboard. Williamsburg could not get the lead at any point, despite this one being close throughout. And then Taylor County pulls away at the end to win by 20. 79-59, your final. And now we go to our final game of the day. North Laurel matching up with Pickett County out of Tennessee. There you see the freshman Peyton Broughton off to a hot start this season. First quarter, North Laurel already down 8-1 to one in this one. Broughton going to see some space and takes it right to the basket for the and one bucket, able to convert despite the foul. Sinks the free throw right here. Good fundamentals from 15 feet out. Jaguars cut the lead in half. Kyle Jeffers now feeding it down low to the other big man, Bryson Asher, the spin fallaway jumper. North Laurel down two. Now it's Broughton getting back into the action, dribbles off the pick, pulls up, cans the jumper. Jags still down two. 
How about Chris Miller for North Laurel? Gets the pass, pump fakes, gets the defender to bite, then pulls up and hits his own jumper. Jags still down by three. Austin Thompson is going to cut it to one with this strong move to the basket. And with that, we move to the second quarter. This is where Pickett got going. Peyton Garrett passes to Taylor Edwards, gets it to Wyatt Bolden, who hits that jumper. Pickett up by seven after that bucket. And then back to the freshman for North Laurel. Broughton dribble, stops, pops, so smooth. That brings the Pickett lead down to five. Then Asher, the big man with the three, jags down by just two. But Pickett County kept firing right back. This is John Michael Farrell who sinks the three-pointer. As we go to the Highlands Black and Blue Clinic scoreboard, Pickett County, Tennessee goes on to defeat the Jaguars 75-65. to One other score to pass along to you. This was also from the legacy Nissan shootout in Laurel County. South Laurel, a three-point win over East Jessamine, 65-62. The Moorhead State Eagles men's basketball team got one heck of a performance Thursday night out of their senior forward Drew Kelly. As Jamie McCracken tells us in this week's Inside the Game, Kelly went off. Drew Kelly's 102nd game of his Moorhead State career will never be forgotten, at least not by him. Uh, you know, it's always great to see shots go in like that. I'm, I'm a very, very realistic and logical person. I understand I'm not going to get 40 a night. Uh, you know, it's just what can I do for my team to help them win night in and night out. If it's get 12 or 15, 10 boards a game, then that's what I need to bring. I'm not really going to focus on trying to score 40 a night or anything like that or that matter. You know, it's just a t basketball is a team game, and that's how we're going to treat it. The senior went ballistic from downtown against South Dakota this past Thursday, scoring 40 points on 14 of 23 shooting. Kelly buried eight three-pointers, and the Eagles defeated South Dakota 120 to 83. I'll tell you what, he's been, you know, playing his, his, his mind's been playing tricks on him. I just told him, go out and have fun, Drew. He and I had a heart-to-heart -heart the other day, two days ago, and he came out and he did exactly what I told him to do. He lost himself in the game, and he ended up with 40 points and 12 rebounds. You know, it was just all a mental and a confidence standpoint for me. And, uh, you know, i got to thank Coach Wes, thank my teammates, thank my family. Just being there to support me. I knew I'd come through. My teammates knew I'd come through. Uh, you know, it was just... I'd rather it be sooner than later, but it was later. Um, you know, but that was a great, great team win right there, you know. Kelly's scoring barrage marked the largest in the Ohio Valley Conference this season. One more three-pointer, and he would have tied the school record. Moorhead State is 8-4 and four on the season and will play at Tennessee on Monday night. For Inside the Game, I'm Jamie McCracken. Coming up on the Appalachian Wireless Sports Overtime Saturday night, college basketball, Michigan State faces a tough road test against Texas, and the Louisville Cardinals fly south to Miami for a matchup with Florida International. The Moorhead State Eagles men's basketball team got one heck of a performance Thursday night out of their senior forward, Drew Kelly. As Jamie McCracken tells us in this week's Inside the Game, Kelly went off. Drew Kelly's 102nd game of his Moorhead State career will never be forgotten, at least not by him. Uh, you know, it's always great to see shots go in like that. I'm, I'm a very, very realistic and logical person. I understand I'm not going to get 40 a night. Uh, you know, it's just what can I do for my team to help them win night in and night out. If it's get 12 or 15, 10 boards a game, then that's what I need to bring. I'm not really going to focus on trying to score 40 a night or anything like that or that matter. You know, it's just a t basketball is a team game, and that's how we're going to treat it. The senior went ballistic from downtown against South Dakota this past Thursday, scoring 40 points on 14 of 23 shooting. Kelly buried eight three-pointers, and the Eagles defeated South Dakota 120 to 83. I'll tell you what, he's been, you know, playing his, his, his mind's been playing tricks on him. I just told him, go out and have fun, Drew. He and I had a heart-to-heart -heart the other day, two days ago, and he came out and he did exactly what I told him to do. Lost himself in the game, and he ended up with 40 points and 12 rebounds. You know, it was just all a mental and a confidence standpoint for me. And, uh, you know, i got to thank Coach Wes, thank my teammates, thank my family. Just being there to support me, I knew I'd come through. My teammates knew I'd come through. Uh, you know, it was just... I'd rather it be sooner than later, but it was later. Um, you know, but that was a great, a great team win right there, you know. Kelly's scoring barrage marked the largest in the Ohio Valley Conference this season. One more three-pointer, and he would have tied the school record. Moorhead State is 8-4 and four on the season and will play at Tennessee on Monday night. For Inside the Game, I'm Jamie McCracken. 
Well, as Kentucky fans well know, Michigan State, one of the few teams early in the season that appears to have enough talent to win the national championship. But the Spartans faced a tough road test today against an unranked Texas team coming off a win over number 14, North Carolina. The Texas Longhorns hosting the number five Michigan State Spartans pick it up midway through the first half. Cameron Ridley bobbles the ball but still gets the jam for the Longhorns inside, ties it up at 19. Later in the first half, Adrian and Payne is going to jam it home for the Spartans. He had a monster game in this one, did Payne. Texas, though, still up 28-22. Longhorn ball to Marcus Croker goes baseline and dunks it for the Longhorns. Take another look at it from a different angle. Texas up 30-24 after the two-handed tomahawk. Second half now, Texas out in transition. That's Javon Felix for three. Longhorn lead pushed to four. Gary Harris hits the jumper and gets the foul for Michigan State. Sparty up 57-54 off the miss three. Gavin Schilling gets the tip in for the Spartans. They pull away from Texas and win this one 92-78. How about the best dressed man in college basketball? Rick Pitino and the Cards taking on FIU. Luke Hancock gets it to Montrez Harrell under the basket. He throws it down. Louisville up three early. Florida International's Dennis Maven is going to swish the three point jumper, cuts the Louisville lead to five. Harrell. He can hand it out, too. Gets the assist to Shane Bahannon, who dunks it, pushes the Cardinal lead to seven. Another Louisville dunk here. The lob by Chris Jones. The Juco transfer to Harrell. Throws it down. Number six cards up 14 at the half. He can dunk in case you didn't know. Second half now. Jones, another assist. Russ Smith hitting the three-pointer. Cards up 42-27. And why not one more dunk by the Cardinals? Terry Rozier to Shane Bahannon. Louisville wins this one e easily, 85-56 to 56 over Florida International. Now the other best-dressed man in college basketball, that's Jay Wright of Villanova taking on Ryder. Ryan Archie Diacono pulls up from three-point land, nails it, then check this out. Archie Diacono hustles down the sideline, dives for a loose ball, goes flying into the stands. He would be okay, no worries. Gets a couple hands over there. Javon Pinkston taking it to the hoop. The layup and one. Nova up 23 to 12. Jimmy Taylor drains the three-pointer for Ryder. They cut the lead to six. We're still in the first half. Chris Jenkins gets the layup for Nova, pushes the lead out to eight. And then Archie Diacono hits the jumper for the Wildcats, lead out to 11. Second half, Pinkston hits the three-pointer. And the game out of reach at this point for Ryder, down 19. Uh, Darren Hilliard going to get the steal in backcourt, and then he will slam it down after the pilfer. Two-handed throwdown. Wildcats of Villanova take this one 88-67 over Ryder. Roy Williams and his North Carolina Tar Heels hosting Davidson. Pick it up second half off the Davidson turnover. Marcus Page lays it up and in, heels up three. Davidson's Tyler Kalinowski makes a layup of his own. They pull to within one. Trading layups now, UNC's turn. Kennedy Meeks for the Tar Heels and the foul, 74-73 lead. Two to play, Brian Sullivan gets fouled on a three-point jumper, makes the three, makes the free throw. Davidson up 76-74. James Michael McAdoo gets its own layup to fall, ties the game at 76 with a minute 30 to play. This one goes to overtime, and it was all North Carolina. Page to Nate Britt. He nails the jumper, 83-79 heels. Now it's Britt to Page. Only this time, Page is going to knock down the three. Page having an awesome season so far for the folks in Chapel Hill. Uh, at Chapel Hill there, that one's good. Davidson gave them a run for their money, but UNC wins this one, 97-85. Up next, the USC Trojans hope what happens in Vegas is a win over Fresno State in the Las Vegas Bowl. The Pikeville Lady Panthers have only one senior on their roster this season, Rachel Potter. And we sat down with the senior point guard in this week's Lee's Famous Recipe of Hazard and Whitesburg Fast Break. Green. Pizza. Just pizza. Vanilla. Hawaii. Sleeping? Studying? Nothing fun. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Candace Parker. Is she who you look up to? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, because she can dunk a basketball, and that, I think that's the coolest thing ever, and I wish I could do that. Um, Kentucky. UK basketball. I would hand it to my parents and let, and let them pay off debts or do whatever they need to do. Channing Tatum because he is so beautiful. Beating Shelby Valley my freshman year. I would, that was my most memorable moment. That's the biggest rivalry, and that's just always fun to do. Unique. What? Um, sophomore year at Eastridge, I airballed a free throw, and that's always terrible. Math. English. Um, I like Dexter. Elf. Actually, not anything really. I can juggle, which is kind of cool. I really can. The Pikeville Lady Panthers have only one senior on their roster this season, Rachel Potter, and we sat down with the senior point guard in this week's Lee's Famous Recipe of Hazard and Whitesburg Fast Break. Green. Pizza. Just pizza. Vanilla. Hawaii. Sleeping? Studying? Nothing fun. <laughs> Candace Parker. Is she who you look up to? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, because she can dunk a basketball, and that, I think that's the coolest thing ever, and I wish I could do that. Um, Kentucky. UK basketball. I would hand it to my parents and let, and let them pay off debts or do whatever they need to do. Channing Tatum because he is so beautiful. Beating Shelby Valley my freshman year. I would, that was my most memorable moment. That's the biggest rivalry, and that's just always fun to do. Unique. What? Um, sophomore year at Eastridge, I airballed a free throw, and that's always terrible. Math. English. Um, I like Dexter. Elf. Mm, 
actually not anything really I can juggle, which is kind of cool. I really can. The University of Southern California football program has been a soap opera of sorts this season. Four different head coaches in less than three months. But the Trojans, with a chance today to reach the 10 win mark against Fresno State in the Royal Purple Las Vegas Bowl. Fresno quarterback Derek Carr amped up to take on the Trojans, but it's USC striking first in this one. Cody Kessler hangs in the pocket, finds Marquise Lee from 10 yards out, and it's 7 0. Later in the quarter, Carr connects with Isaiah Burst for 8 yards and a touchdown. Extra point, no good. USD still up 7-6. And then Carr off play action, hooks up with Nelson Aguilar, 40 yards for a touchdown, 14-6 Trojans. Second quarter, Kessler goes back to Aguilar for 17 yards and another touchdown, initially ruled incomplete. But take another look. He's able to get his feet down in time, 21-6 USC. Trojans go to the ground game. Javorius Allen finds a seam on the right side and scampers in for the 24-yard touchdown, 28-6 at that point. USC not done though. Kessler hits a wide open Marquise Lee again. 40 yards to the house. 35-6 USC and the Trojans go on to win it. 45-20 over Fresno State. Coming up we'll announce our player of the week. That's next on the Appalachian or rather the play of the week. That's next on the Appalachian Wireless Sports Overtime Saturday night. Now time for our play of the week. Colorado State playing Washington State in the New Mexico Bowl. Rams run the old Statue of Liberty play for the two-point conversion. Watch the replay. It will confirm that Donnell Alexander did make it in for the two-point conversion to tie the game at 45. We're going to get to the replay right here. Watch sticks his right arm out. The football clearly knocks over the pylon. That ties the game at 45. CSU then kicks a field goal to win it. An incredible comeback. Back. The Rams were down 22 in this game. They beat Washington State 48-45, and that is our play of the week. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Appalachian Wireless Sports Overtime Saturday night. We'll see you out on the field next week. But until then, for the entire sports and production departments, have a good night.